The date is Christmas Eve 2019, and deep in the heart of Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado, technicians are working at the North American Aerospace Defense Command, otherwise known as NORAD, to track the flight of a Russian rocket launch. In accordance with international regulations, the Russian space agency Roscosmos formally announced the launch weeks before and filed a flight plan with the UN. The launch is a curious one, as the launch trajectory doesn't follow the typical equatorial or polar orbital trajectories of most spacecraft. The Russians claim that the rocket contains a probe, which will use the highly eccentric orbit to rendezvous with a medium-sized asteroid flying past the Earth a few million miles away, itself on a highly eccentric orbit. The math checks out, and thus, as NORAD tracks the launch entering space above the US, there's no reason for alarm. Nonetheless, American space and ground-based imaging assets still track the curious Russian probe. The rocket seems to be smaller than anticipated for the launching of a deep space probe, but the Russians claim that their probe is powered by an ion engine which doesn't require Require much fuel. Some inside of the American aerospace and defense sector are suspicious that the launch is actually a new secret Russian military satellite, and thus NORAD is ordered to track its trajectory carefully and detect if any sub-vehicles are released from the main body of the spacecraft as it reaches orbit. The Russian spacecraft reaches a point in its orbit over the middle of the United States when suddenly the numerous electronic eyes and ears following its flight go blind all at once. At first, NORAD technicians believe that there must be some computer error within NORAD's systems itself as the command post is not receiving any data from over a dozen of the surveillance platforms it had been using. In fact, several other assets have apparently gone offline as well, including satellites and ground-based communications and tracking stations. Then an icy cold chill grips the men deep inside their bunker at NORAD. A secret global surveillance network of space-based sensors begin to phone home, and the news they're reporting is terrifying. This sensor system dates back to the 1970s and have only one job, monitor the entire surface of the Earth from very high orbits and detect all the telltale flash and heat of a nuclear explosion. Originally designed to help enforce the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which prohibited the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, outer space, or underwater, this space surveillance network was left in operation to help prevent rogue states from testing weapons in remote areas of the world. Now the decades-old system is calling home, and the news is troubling. A major nuclear detonation has been detected directly over the heart of the United States. Several hundred miles above the US, a nuclear flash briefly creates a second sun and lights up the sky above much of the US. Simultaneously, the titanic electromagnetic pulse sweeps over the entire nation, burning out power and communication systems across across the entirety of the US and most of Mexico and Canada. Power transformers are blown and the electricity across most of the nation is shut down permanently. Cities go dark all across the US. Radio and satellite communications equipment across the nation is destroyed by the electromagnetic pulse, and only a few pieces of military equipment, specifically hardened against EMP pulses, survives. In space above the US, the blast destroys dozens of satellites, knocking out communication relay networks that connect the world. The EMP blast reaches further out and manages to destroy many more satellites, though luckily more modern satellites have been hardened against the effects of the sun and are shielded from the EMP blast. In the span of a few short seconds, the United States has been sent back to the industrial age. It will take weeks to restore cross-country communications and months to begin to bring back the power to major cities. It will be years, perhaps as much as a decade, before the American electrical grid is fully repaired. Millions will die in time, and yet this was just the opening shot of World War III. NORAD is itself shielded from the effects of an EMP pulse and immediately it uses an old but still reliable communications network to send emergency action messages across the country. These messages reach several important American military bases, and in moments, men and women scramble to respond to the Russian attack. Everybody knows what's next, and it's vitally important that the nation restore its ability to respond to this attack as quickly as possible. Deep in the heart of Russia, giant concrete doors are already yawning open. Klaxons and warning signals sound out across a Russian plane, broken up only by the dozens of missile silos buried deep beneath its dirt. With the fiery roar, each missile missile lifts up into the sky one by one. At NORAD, a surviving satellite sends a missile launch warning. The president has been warned over an emergency relay system, but communications all across the US are severely hampered by the EMP attack. Nobody, not even the president, can reach the rest of the United States' nuclear alert forces to order a retaliatory attack, let alone command the US military at large. At Travis Air Force Base in California and Patuxent River in Maryland, flight and support crew rush from their alert station to huge egg-white painted aircraft. Ground crew rush to complete the few 
few preparations needed to get this aircraft into the air, and within minutes the big plane is already lumbering down the runway. This plane carries no bombs, no missiles, no weapons of any kind, and yet as the two aircraft on opposite sides of the country finally take to the air, they have now become the most dangerous weapons on the face of the planet. The E-6 Mercuries immediately make for a cruising altitude around 50,000 feet. Each plane is manned by two pilots and three engineers, along with a battle staff of nine. Amongst the airborne staff is a general officer, and if communications with the president or any other member of the nation's nuclear command authority can't be established, each general can assume full command of the United States' military, to include its nuclear forces. The E-6 is outfitted with a vast array of extremely powerful, jam-resistant and EMP-hardened communications gears. Antenna ring the aircraft and in moments, it has linked up with the nation's emergency airborne command and control aircraft, a fleet of similar planes whose job is to create an airborne communication relay system across the United States and beyond. With ground-based comms down and the US's space network severely affected, this fleet of aircraft now provide a direct link communications network, relaying signals off each other and to their final destination. Shortly after the E-6s reach cruising altitude though, news comes in of a second nuclear detonation in Washington DC. This was a ground-based blast, and both crews realized that the Russians have struck at the nation's capital with a small nuclear weapon that was likely smuggled into the US. This explosion has eliminated nearly all of the upper-level command and control structure of the U.S. government, and yet the mission of each E-6 is unaffected by the attempt to decapitate the U.S. military and government. Assuming command, the general officer aboard the E-6, currently flying a few dozen miles off the east coast of the United States, immediately re-establishes communications with the U.S.'s ground-based missile forces. Using a system of very high-frequency and super-high-frequency antennas, the E-6 is able to alert launch control officers deep in their bunkers to prepare their missiles for launch. The the communication system affords so much control over the US's land-based ICBMs that the general now in command of the United States nuclear forces is able to reprogram the targets to several of the missiles. A second command instructs the United States Air Force to immediately begin launches of its Space Resilience Program, and in minutes, converted ICBMs kept at the ready are rocketing into the sky. Shortly after, the payload fairing on each of the converted ICBMs split open, releasing a swarm of micro-satellites which have been boosted into orbit around the Earth. The micro satellites immediately re-establish the US's space communications and intelligence network, and starts feeding data directly into each E-6 Mercury currently in flight. Now the general aboard the East Coast's E-6 is finally able to communicate with US military forces abroad and with America's allies. Within seconds, the world at large is aware of the attack on the United States, and NATO makes preparations for war. US forces abroad prepare for the war that will immediately follow the end of the world. From the rear of each E-6, an antenna is released and then dropped to trail behind the aircraft. With 5 miles of wiring, the very low frequency antenna at the end of the wire now hangs 26,000 feet below and behind the aircraft, and immediately establishes communications with the US's submarine fleet. Emergency action messages are relayed to American ballistic missile submarines, and the captains of individual boats race to make their missiles ready for launch. It's now 15 minutes after the EMP attack, and space-based sensors along with a few surviving ground tracking stations confirm dozens of Russian nuclear warheads in their mid-course trajectories. Ballistic missile interceptors based on the west coast of the United States boost into the air, launching from their silos in Alaska, California, and Washington. Thanks to data links provided by the E-6 Mercuries, the interceptors are able to close in on Russian warheads, though unfortunately they manage a measly kill ratio that knocks only a few handful of the dozens of incoming nuclear warheads out of the sky. The next line of defense is the US Navy, and with targeting data relayed by the E-6's network capabilities, American destroyers on the west coast and in the Arctic fire off a salvo of SM-3 missiles, intercepting the incoming warheads in their final trajectories. The Navy fares a little better than the Air Force's ballistic missile interceptors, and another handful of warheads are knocked out of the sky by the SM-3s. Now the crew of each E-6 aircraft braces itself. There's nothing left to do but wait for the inevitable. Luckily, they don't have to wait long. A minute after the Navy's last-ditch effort to intercept the incoming warheads, the first nuclear strike rocks the west coast of the United States. Miraculously, Los Angeles suffers only a glancing blow. Some of the warheads aimed at it intercepted in flight. San Francisco and San Diego, however, are obliterated, each taking multiple direct hits. Thirty seconds later, the nuclear detonations spread east, reaching Colorado, Nevada, and Wyoming. NORAD is rocked by a near miss but survives intact. The nuclear missile fields in Montana and the Dakotas are obliterated by multiple strikes, though their own missiles have already been launched. 
Two minutes after the first impact, New York, Atlanta, and Philadelphia are wiped off the map. Washington, already rocked by a small ground-based nuclear weapon, is struck again for good measure. Three minutes after the first detonations, the US is silent. Most of its major cities have been reduced to rubble. Over a hundred million are already dead. America's military command structure survives, however, and the crews of the in-flight E-6 watch on monitors as the first American nuclear strikes devastate Russia. The first to strike back are America's ballistic missile submarines, and their missiles devastate Russia's seaboard cities. A few minutes later, American ICBMs rain down extinction in Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Vladivostok. The first phase of World War III is over, but the war itself has only just begun. The E-6 aircraft link up with American's Airborne Emergency Communications Network and its space assets to coordinate the military response by the US's overseas forces. Many overseas American bases have been struck in the nuclear attack, but the ability to quickly restore communications afforded by the E-6s means that many other forces managed to disperse in time to avoid destruction. Now the E-6s relay orders around the globe to all surviving US and NATO forces who prepare for an assault into Russia in order to ensure that World War III does not have a follow-up nuclear exchange. Should the US have a backup system in case of a sneak attack by a foreign adversary? What do you think the war that follows a full nuclear exchange would look like? Tell us in the comments. Now go watch What If There Was A Nuclear War Between The US And Russia. As always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content.